rise a few years ago, up to $140 a barrel. And at that time, the container ships coming from Asia to the west coast of the United States with all the consumer goods that uh, people seem to want to, want to buy cost uh, $17,000 a day for <coughs> oil to run that ship. When the price spiked to $140 a barrel, it began to cost them it cost them $38,000 a day in fuel to run that ship. Uh, Jeff Rubin, the oil analyst, says that's the limit. Beyond that, it's no longer going to be economic for anybody to ship that merchandise from Asia to North America. Oil will probably get back to that. We don't know when, but it certainly will, because there's a limited amount. We're heading into a peak oil period. Uh, so when we get to $150, $200, $300 barrel, the consequence will be that the kind of world trade, the kind of globalization of world trade that we have been told can sort of go on forever will go into reverse. The logic of oil price in the oil market will simply cause that to happen. At that point, at that point, and well before, even now, there will be great opportunities for the relocalization of manufacturing of all sorts throughout our communities. So that's the good news. Uh, as oil prices spike, it will create tremendous opportunities for uh, organizations, businesses, uh, schools like Olney to, to, to figure out how to relocalize various kinds of products and services. Um, so those are, those are sort of two perspectives that the work, the work of uh, the Quaker Institute for the Future is taking into account in the kind of material that we've been analyzing and reporting on. What I'd like to do uh, is to shift a bit to go back to another period in my, uh, in my life when I was working with French Road College. French Road College started in 1965, New York Yearly Meeting, founded what they conceived of as, a, as an international educational institution. The plan was to bring students and faculty from around the world to a campus on Long Island and create a cross-cultural learning situation. <clears throat> the classic Quaker idea in terms of the more cross-cultural experience we can foster, the more international goodwill, cooperation, and peaceful relations will result. Uh, they hired Morris Mitchell, a veteran educator, uh, to direct the college, and he said, look, why don't we just turn around? Instead of bringing everybody from elsewhere in the world to North America, why don't we set up study centers in all the cultural regions of the world, and students travel to those centers, students come into the program in those centers, and we create a truly multicultural uh, educational program. And so that's, that's what actually happened. But beyond that, the other thing that Morris brought to the program was the idea that education, world education, should actually be an agent for social change. This was 1965, the Cold War was still in full, full tilt. All kinds of social problems were mounting. The environmental crisis was just beginning to come into people's awareness. Morris saw all these things as global problems that need to be understood in a global context and designed the curriculum, the, the core curriculum of the college around those kinds of problems. So what, what seems to me to be the connection with Omni, and I'm, I'm really astounded because when I read through this sheet uh, of proposals, the first couple of sections had to deal with international education. And I had no idea that that was kind of on the horizon for a This is my first time here. And it seems to me that what some of these proposals speak to is really uh, a continuation of this kind of program for only. <laughs> right, I will I'll wind up. Uh, I have other things to say to make on the panel, I'll be able to say them. But um, French World College continues, actually. It's a part of Long Island University. It became a part of Long Island University. It's not called Global College, but it still has the same kind of program. But it seems to me one of the opportunities identified here for, for only is that internationalizing of your, of your program it makes so much sense, both economically, but also from the standpoint of the mission. And looking at 
looking at environmental education, not just as education about the environment, but education in the environment. So every time you go out, anything you're looking at, part of the environment, a whole range of social, economic, environmental issues can be looked at from a learning point of view, and that's what develops the habit of lifelong learning. Good afternoon. I'm pleased that you are willing to sit and listen to the story of a farm market at Woodstock, New Brunswick. Back in the early 70s, when we established a farm in the St. John River Valley of New Brunswick, we had moved into a rural area. And in that rural area, if you weren't born there, if your parents weren't from there, if your grandparents weren't from there, you were from away. And that somehow mattered. That was important to the people in this area. So we had to be sensitive to the area in which we were moving. One of the ladies in the town related the story. Oh, did you see the hippies that just moved in down the road? Oh, no, they're not hippies. They work. <laughs> but as part of our farm operation, we needed a place to market our produce. And so I set about to establish and organize a farm market where not only us could market their products, but the people in the community could market their products. And women became very important in this endeavor. Um, they became skilled. They became knowledgeable. They grew in confidence in getting out there and meeting the public. In fact, it was an area where husbands said no, they didn't want their wives going out to work because they were the provider. But it was really interesting to watch after the woman becoming really well known for her products, the husband coming to market with her and standing beside her and smiling broadly. You could tell he was proud of what she was doing. Those were the kinds of things that was really, really wonderful to see. There's a certain amount of risk that people need to take when they are embarking on a venture like this. The first day that we opened the market, there were eight producers that showed up. The editor of the local newspaper was very supporting. The banner across the headline, across the, the paper that next week read, Farm Market Sold Out by 9.30. The next week, there were 17. And so you could see the element of that rural culture that you needed to be sensitive to, that you needed to know to work with. But it was a sense of empowering. It was a sense of ownership that they had of that farm market as we established it back in the 70s. That market is still going. We moved a lot of places. We built a new building. It has changed a bit as farmers are falling like flies and it's impossible to make a living from produce. Uh, but uh, it has now become a very sustainable craft market along with products and is open six days a week, not just one day a week. Other uh, endeavors that we became involved with in that community was the establishment of a grist mill um, in which farmers were contracted to raise wheat and oats and brought them to the mill for processing and marketing on a bioregional basis.